So I'm speaking with uh, composer Carlos Rafael Rivera, who made his impressive debut as a film composer with uh, the score to Scott Frank's A Walk Among the Tombstones, starring Liam Neeson. Uh, Scott Frank, who is mainly known for his screenwriting on films such as Minority Report, Logan, and Get Shorty, returns to direct this new Netflix uh, Western limited series, uh, Godless. Uh, Carlos is reteaming with Scott for the six-episode series. Uh, Carlos, it's so great to chat. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it is a real privilege to be here, so thank you. And so, so to start, I'd love to kind of know your background with music, kind of when did, it be, when did it become a career path choice in your life, and what directed you towards uh, film and television? Oh, man. Um, I think, you know, okay, if we could start with the music lesson stuff, I began taking piano lessons when I was six and stopped. I was living in Guatemala. Mm-hmm. Then we moved to Costa Rica and then to Panama, and when I was 11 in Panama, I began to study classical guitar, just basic scale stuff, and then... But by the time I turned 13, uh, Randy Rhodes became the reason I decided to play electric guitar. And um, I remember smiling like uncontrollably when I first heard this solo for Revelation, Mother Earth. I don't know if you know Ozzy Osbourne. Do you know Ozzy Osbourne yes. at all? And my, and, okay. my, and my wife is the biggest Ozzy fan okay. in the world. Well, the Diary of a Man Man album, which is like his first solo release after Black Sabbath, um, the next to last track is a song called Revelation, Mother Earth. And it had this incredible, it had a classical guitar throughout, but then this incredible guitar solo. And I remember just smiling. Like I really couldn't, I just don't. I didn't realize I was smiling till the song ended. You know, it was one of those weird moments. And I said, I said to myself, like, well, uh, you know, the day I'm able to play that guitar solo, you know, right. I'll be amazing. You know, that's the. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, after a few years, man, and we moved to Miami by that time, and it was a lot of time spent in the in the room, just you know, moving the needle on the record back to the beginning and playing and playing and playing. And that fateful day came, um, but something unexpected happened as soon as I like nailed the last note and I heard it cause I used to record it on audio cassette. Mm-hmm. I'm 47. So I'm like right at the end of all that awesome, you know, analog stuff. Right. So, um, as soon as I nailed that last note and I heard it back, I was like, yes, <laughs> uh, but I didn't write it. Like this weird feeling of like, it wasn't really mine, you know, even though like I'd written it, like, I mean, played it and I could, you know, that, that the fandom of being able to attain it in my hand, I realized it. And that sort of like was the beginning of how do you do this? And it wasn't until later on until I, you know, got to college, I was going to study accounting and, um, I was taking a music appreciation class cause I'd been in bands after that. And I heard the Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. And the best thing that happened is that the, the, our teacher, Jay Brown, uh, was teaching at Miami Day College and he was a, he was a guy and he was awesome cause he was totally into music. Like you'd walk in and it was just like an experience. People, have you ever had great teachers? Like just, Oh, yeah, they're the. I mean, they 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 light a fire in you. It's it's yep. so integral. Yeah, it, and he and, and it's the least you expect. That's why I love teaching too, because because of people like that. You know, they they just come in your life. And he literally redirected from accounting to music. And he he was walking around with the score and showing this like, this massive swell that happens in the brass section. And I looked at it and on paper. It was like two notes. I was like, oh, that's all that is. And it, it felt like it felt like it was humanly possible to do what seemed impossible to do to write music. And then to write music for orchestra was like, you know, right, I, yeah. I, I, I would never thought it would happen. I don't even know if I've answered your question. <laughs> no, you have. Um, so at, at what point did you, um, I guess take this and I guess focus it into a, a career path. How did you know this is what you want to do for a living? And then what were kind of the first jobs you started you know, trying to make this into, to do it for a living? Like how did you kind of make that into your career? Well, teaching has been part of, everything I've done since, you know, since day one, like Mm -hmm. it's, you know, I was teaching and playing guitar, uh, and making music since, you know, my teenage years. And, um, and through both, I felt really connected to, to just, you know, either giving back it through music or by, you know, like, like Jay, Jay Brown, who I had and, um, as a teacher, but I started, um, I got out of high school and I switched to music and then I moved to USC to Los Angeles to go to USC to get my master's degree. Mm-hmm. And at, during that time we got signed to a record label. So uh-huh. I, I started making a living for like basically like three years in 2000. We were signed to Universal Records with uh, a band called Zoo Story. And the singer was Randy Coleman. He was like my partner in crime and he was a song, lead songwriter and um, awesome singer and really cool band. But then everything like fell apart, you know, um, there was like, no, the record wasn't ultimately released, you know, and I got, 
I don't know if you remember a TV show called Behind the Music on VH1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we were the one episode that no one ever would have cared to see, but literally, <laughs> it was <laughs> like nothing. Every we went through all of that ride without even having a release, you know. Yeah. So but we got really lucky because we got, you know, the the head of the label that signed us was a na- guy by the name of Tom Shadyac, who's a director. And he did like Liar Liar and Bruce yeah, Almighty. I, yeah, I know that name. Yeah, but the guy is just amazing. People like it's like one of the you know the few and far between that you find that are just gold. And and we had this deal go on, and he just you know said you can walk away. There's no debt because usually you get advances, right? Mm, so yeah. we didn't have to pay anything back. But at that time, I was sort of really lost, and so there wasn't a living. When you talk about a career, I think it's been really up and down as far as what I was going to do. I, I always taught and teaching was always part of the deal, but everything I've considered outside of teaching right now, I teach at the university of Miami and, um, uh, was teaching, uh, uh, you know, as an adjunct at USC by the time I was getting my doctoral degree, but I was really like lost as far as what, what I was going to do outside of that world. And, um, I decided to go back to studying and getting my degree by the time the label had folded. And um, at that point, I got mentored with Randy Newman right, yeah. because of USC. And I was expecting maybe a 15-minute visit to his house. And it turned out to be like you know a two-hour hang. And it was like a real, real privilege, man. I, I, it's become a friendship over the years. And more than anything, a true mentorship in that he was um, having me over the sessions. Um, the recording sessions that he was doing. And right. so I learned about how to be in the room uh, because I was definitely a fly on the wall, you know, you know, and just watching him be. But as producers would make a suggestion or a director would make, I saw how he would take the suggestion. And in my world, I always thought he'd be like, you know, hey, I'm Randy Coleman. I mean, Randy Coleman is the other guy I worked with. I'm Randy Newman. I do what I want, you know. Um, yeah. It wasn't that. It was sort of like teamwork. And they were all in this storytelling approach, trying to make it work. And I was like, wow, I never dreamed I'd get the opportunity to do this. Like right now, I'm even talking to you and I'm like, wow, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, to, to truly kind of pursue something that you love so much and it becomes a job when it's not really a job. It's kind of just who you are. And I think that's such a, a, a privilege to have that because not everyone gets that and you get to just you feel so lucky that you get to kind of do what you love. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just being in those sessions was like, wow. And then as my daughter was born and, you know, and then my son, you know, watching the movie, you know, that we were at the sessions for, you know, it's, it's just surreal. You know, you're like, Oh my God, I was there. You yeah, know, you have those yeah. moments. But, uh, but, uh, what happened was at that time when I had gone back to get my doctoral degree, along with the mentorship program, I started teaching privately, you know, again, mm-hmm. cause the band had was, was not happening anymore. And, um, at Old Town Music in Pasadena, Scott Frank was just looking for guitar teachers. He, you know, my name was, I put my name, you know, on a flyer. And then oh, he wow. was looking through this book and he found my name and he just picked it. And this is like 2003 or four. It was around that time. And so I showed up and I, I saw the posters on his office, you know, in Pasadena. I was like, oh, oh, he's, oh, he wrote Minority Report. Oh my God, he did Out of Sight. And when I got home, I was like, honey, you won't believe who I'm teaching. You know, is that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And and it was always like, it, it was always kind of like in, in a cool way because he he has still a very sincere and um, I don't know how to, else to say it, but like youthful curiosity about mm-hmm. music. And And what I felt like, my job wasn't so much to teach him guitar, but it was sort of music, you know? And I, and I always felt like, well, if he's involved in this, and this was before he directed, um, I felt my job was to, you know, help him speak the language of music. Um, Cause I was teaching him during the time his, he did his first movie called The Lookout. And what ended up happening was um, I, I was like, okay. He was like, I'm gonna work with James Newton Howard. I was like, okay, man. Uh, okay, so this is what we're going to do. And I started just like, you know, the idea of how to talk to a composer was sort of what I got into. Right. But as he got busy, he stopped lessons for like a year because he went away, had to shoot the movie. And 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 as I've learned later, it's, whoo, it's a lot. It's all your time. It's 25 hours a day. Yeah. And so it, for me, it was a privilege to watch that happen. And then I saw the movie and I was like, hey, man, great job, blah, blah, blah. But I, at the time... Everything was going well in the classical world because I was already getting my doctoral degree at USC. 
and uh, some of the orchestral music and some of the music that I'd written for guitar was doing well outside of school, like out of outside of academia. I'd won some awards, et cetera. And, and so he was always aware of that. But it never was my intention to go, hey, man, I'll score your movie. Like, yeah. I never, I've never felt like I respect the place. And my role in his life was his music teacher, right. you know. And I and because I've been a teacher all my life, I love the idea of giving back and, and just it, having him have a better vocabulary to communicate. Um, and one day, man, if this is getting long, just stop me. No, I'm, keep going. This is really interesting. <laughs> okay, okay, I started getting bored right now. I was like, stop. Um, <laughs> no. But but at, at one day he was like, this is like now three years in, four years into the lessons, you know. And he's like, Carlos, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. You not once have asked me to score anything. And I was like. I know. And he goes, why? And I go, well, because I'm your music teacher. And yeah, but you've done, you've mentored with Randy Newman. And at the time I'd actually done something. It's a little bit of a side story, but it literally is what prepared me to start working with Scott. Mm -hmm. That uh, another guitar student of mine, (laughs) Michael Legato, was a guitar student of mine. And I taught at the Pasadena Conservatory as well. You know, because when you talk about, about career, I was getting my degree at USC and making a living teaching in different places, you know, and guitar. And so uh, one of the students, I, I was teaching at the Pasadena Conservatory. I had won this uh, award and this perform- orchestral performance had happened, et cetera. And the student was asking me, hey, you know, I saw this thing that they put out, this announcement by the conservatory about your, your piece. Could you, do you have a recording? I was like, yeah, of course, man, of course. And I gave it to him. I well, had only met his mom because his mom brought him to the music class. That's it. I didn't even know. But his dad is Rob Legato, who's a VFX guy who has done, like, worked with Scorsese over the years. He won the Academy Award for Avatar. I mean, I'm I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. I I know it's for Titanic. (laughs) He won won it, but he also did. I think he just won it for The Jungle Book. And he's, like, the VFX guy. And he came back to me, like, the next week. He goes, you know, I played the stuff for my dad. And I go, cool. Not thinking, who's your dad? Like, you know? And he goes really likes it he's making this little short thing for adobe and he'd like you to score it i go what and he goes he'll he'll give you a call and then i started looking up legato legato like like trying to see how you know on google search yeah in the old days. and um and it came up that it was him i was like oh my god so <laughs> he gave me this opportunity to do it i scored this thing and it was a noir little ditty it was like five minutes long or so and I got, I learned about how to use Logic, which is the, the you know, digital workstation I used to write. And back to now, Scott. And Scott goes, you've never asked me, you know, to do this. And I, um, and I said, well, it's because I'm a guitar teacher. And he goes, you know, sometimes you just got to ask, Carlos. I go, okay, well, then I'm asking. <laughs> I like, he goes, well, I'm working on this movie right now. And he was writing a screenplay for uh, uh, the Planet of the Apes movie. He was mm-hmm. working on it. And it ended up going away, and I ended up moving to Miami. But we began a process that sort of has translated into what became A Walk Among the Tombstones and then through Godless, which is um, he'd give me the screenplay, and I'd write to the screenplay. Oh, so wow. I, there's no picture. It's just getting a sense of tone, getting a sense of character, and try, and really reacting to the story as I read it. Because he kind of doesn't suck as a screenwriter. Yeah, he's really great. Yeah, He's, he's like one of the truly one of the best reads you'll have if you ever get a chance to read screenplays I, some of them are online i think out of sight one i think is and um it, it's ridiculous man so you're reading it you're like oh my god so the music could do this and you start like getting into the idea of what the music could be as you're reading the story like any book you read you know yeah and so i would start writing through logic because i learned from my experience with rob legato um i started making these quick time movies um they were like, uh, you know, just like the screenplay, but as a quick time movie. So like, and I set it at, at the reading pace that you have, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. so you're watching a white background and then the black text, like the type font, whatever it is mm-hmm. as a screen. And then I started scoring that. So the pace of reading is what determined the tempo of the music. And I started doing that, uh, for the planet of the apes thing that he was doing when he was doing it, I started getting the hang of that. And definitely for A Walk Among the Tombstones, that opening sequence, I mean, the title credits of that movie, if you watch it, it was basically inspired by the music I'd written after I'd uh, read the screenplay. And there was a few scenes that had that. 
And so by the time we got to Godless, it was uh, we had sort of a shorthand that we'd, yeah, we'd come sure. from. But uh, always an education. I mean, my God, man, that I can't I can't believe I didn't get fired. <laughs> I mean, and I, I'm glad you didn't because the score that you did for Walk Among the Tombstones, I remember listening to it. I remember it was I really I really loved it. And um, and it's it's a dark film. You know, it's, it, is, it has kind of a dark tone and goes really kind of deep into the the belly of the whale in terms of the hero's journey how, how did you guys figure out the the proper tone musically for that because it seemed like it could have been a, a kind of a challenge there oh man there was like the, first of all that was really an education like it was college like straight up yeah. and, and 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 the movie had like a couple of additional characters initially in the first version of it so this exercise of writing to the screenplay set the tone of a lot of the music. It was mm. sort of a noirish film. Yeah. As we started seeing the picture assembled, uh, it wasn't working. Not I don't know about the movie, but the music definitely needed a change. There had to be more movement. There had to be this whole thing. So I, I really went to more of a rock and roll score. And, you know, it was just working to that version of the p- picture. But after that first screening, you know, at that movie's go through, um, but the, the rhythm of the picture wasn't working, so there had to be like a whole, uh, Scott had to go back and really, you know, rethink the story, how it was being told. Yeah. Because that had even changed from what the original screenplay was. Oh, wow. And so he went back to version one. So, <laughs> so what happened is that I scored sort of like two movies by that time, you know, in a way as far as tone. And um, when he went back, he's like, it's gotta be noir again. But it can't be the first thing you did because I've redone everything. I need you to redo everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, me being in the situation I was, you know, I was like, absolutely no problem. <laughs> so, and so I ended up redoing, it, you know, all the score in about a month's time. It was a wow. real, yeah, it, it was a real, real miracle. But I got help because I was working with really the top, you know, sound design. It was Wiley Statement. Um, who's done all the Quentin Tarantino films, and it's just ridiculous, man. It's just uh, we we call him Obi Wan Kenobi, you know. <laughs> excuse you. And then, um, and then Tom Kramer as a music editor was brought in, and he, my God, man, he really, really helped me get through the finish line because I remember in that crazy month, you know, towards the beginning, there was this longer queue, and I had about twenty seconds to go, and I hit a wall, and it's like three in the morning, and I'm like. I go, Tom, I have no, I, I can't, I, mm-hmm. I don't even, I'm out, I'm done. I, I, and not in the dramatic, like, Ooh, I'm done. It was just like, I, I do not have more. And he goes, okay, hold on. Let's, let's break down the scene. It's like, what? And like wisdom, you know, came yeah. out and, <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like, I got to that 20 seconds, no problem. Literally within an hour after wow. that. And, and so he was, um, he's been doing, if you look him up on IMDb, Tom Kramer, it's like, Jesus, Lord almighty yeah. or any deity. It's just like, wow, he's amazing. And um, so he it was a really great thing to be able to work with him because he really helped me get, like I said, to to the finish line on that. And and we went back to sort of where we'd started tonally speaking. It's a noir film and it committed and Scott in his last version committed to take the pace he did. And and I respect him for that, you know, because uh, we're at a time I think where a lot of fast pace. Everything's cut scene, blah, 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 you know. Yeah. And. And um, he really chose to take his time to tell that story, and and I I appreciate being part of it yeah, for and, sure. And the final product, I mean, it turned out such a great film and great score. And uh, now you're reuniting for for Godless, and which is a Western miniseries that's going to be streaming on Netflix. Uh, for for this project, um, I mean, what were the kind of conversations that you kind of had at the beginning? I mean, it is a Western. Does that just the fact that you say Western? Does that make it go okay? We have to make it a Western score. Was that kind of how you went went about it or did you kind of try to do play with the genre a bit i feel like the main thing is that scott really wanted to do a vintage film like mm-hmm. uh, like a note to the western as as maybe even you imagine you know yeah, in, the, yeah. in its greatest moments you know the vistas uh the sprawling landscapes and i was more concerned about the music in the sense of like harmonica mm-hmm. you know like do i go there or you know and like because it, it's a really scary thing to take on that genre because it's so iconic. Like right. you're step, you're really walking among giants and trying to not a step on their toes, 
be cheesy, be make because it could easily go cheesy musically. Yeah, because it's you know, an you, iconic sound. When you say Western, people think Ennio Morricone. They think the kind of the, sure. all of that. So it comes with a kind of a expectation. So oh yeah, yeah. So that might make, that would be daunting. <laughs> and I tried. I tried. Actually, I had. I think it was called. I I ended up calling. There's a guy called Edwin Wendler. It was great. Uh, yeah, he's a really good composer. Yeah, I know Edwin. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so and Peter Hackman and 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 I've I've kind of known them through, from the Tombstone stuff, and then sort of like you know Facebook friends or whatever, and then and I've seen them when I can. I, they're just cool people. And I remember I had got I gotten a harmonica set, and I was really getting into playing harmonica. Now I can't, but like a year ago, easy. And I you know, came up with this melody and I'm like, God, dude, this sounds familiar, but I think it's awesome. I think it's mine, but let me check. And I called Edwin and Peter. I was like, Hey guys, uh, check this out. Like I'm gonna play this for you and, and tell me if does it sound like anything or is it just a hundred percent me? <laughs> and then I play it and it was the reverse score, you know? So it was like totally, <laughs> they called me out halfway through the melody. They're like, stop. And I was like, Oh man. So I, that was like as close as I ever got to doing harmonica. And, um, and I, and, and, and so that was sort of like, I, we tried a lot of things again because we had the screen. I got the screenplay in November of 2015. Oh wow. That's yeah. So, and and this is before Scott had expanded it because it it was going to be made into a mini series. And, and actually, uh, somewhere in 2003 or four, when I'd started lessons with him, mm-hmm. I showed up to a lesson and he's like, check this out. I just wrote this scene. And it was basically a scene that Frank Griffin does by a campfire. You'll see it in the movie. And it, I was like, oh my God, this, this character is horrible. And he's like, yeah, he's the bad guy of this thing. I was like, cool. Moving on. Let's take the guitar. Let's play C chord or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and then now here we were and, and I read the screenplay and I was like, oh my God, dude, this is the scene. So wow. um, I started working on that and reacting to it immediately. I wrote like the opening. I started I, the idea of, of choir, which sort of still stayed there. It, it, it always evolves, but it started to set the tone of what it should be. Uh, by January of 16, a couple months into it, then I took on the theme because I really started looking at all what I consider to be the set pieces in the story the main characters in the story and and there there are quite a few so who gets a theme who doesn't you know what when when do you get lost in that and when does it start to become too much information and uh, the main concern i had was tone because for for tombstones there was a lot of a lot of tonal setting more than melodic i tried to do melody and i i was able to work some in but but really it was like you know and it's also very much a thing that's consistent today like you're hearing a lot of films more mood music than you do melodic music True, so yeah. my main concern was like with a producer like Soderbergh, you know, what would they gravitate to? Would they gravitate towards, you know, tone? Because Soderbergh's a tone guy. Yeah, you I mean, know, Cliff, he works with Cliff, and yeah, it's just. <laughs> yeah, and that and that, believe me, has its time and space, and it and it and I'm sure someone like him could have come in and kicked butt on on a show like this. But Scott was really going for melody. Right. So I came up with a theme, and he loved it, and I was. On, not expecting that. I was expecting him to say, cool, we'll see what happens. But he was like really into it. And that started to become sort of lend itself towards Roy Good, which is the main good character. And I did a variation on the theme uh, based on the rhythm of the notes. Da, 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 da. That's sort of like the main theme. Mm-hmm. So I, I changed it for him. It was do, 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 do. Like these little variations on it for him in the important moments. And I fully expected by like January, February of 16 that by the time we'd be talking now, that theme would have been thrown away and I would have had to do three rewrites because I had to do that for Tombstones. But it stayed and it stayed all the way through, all the way through to the end of production. And it's the main it's in every episode at the beginning. And man, it's just I'm fascinated that I got that that theme stayed because it really started dictating the tone of the show of the of the score wow so over the, the six episodes how much music was there total <laughs> well it's seven episodes oh, seven actually. sorry seven i know you're not you shouldn't be because on imdb i saw i actually went yesterday and um and i saw this basically i think it still says six and so if you look it up it shows six episodes maybe you can check now i don't know but it was it was uh it's seven it was supposed to be six but oh, okay. the story he needed to tell more story, and it ne- you just there were certain things he couldn't cut out, so we ended up making it seven episodes. So, um, 
Oh, so over the, it's about seven and a half hours long, I think, is yeah. the story. And so it's like a massive film. And, you know, it really has that kind of arc. It and goes you treat it, yeah, you probably treated it as like a seven hour film rather than episode one, episode two, episode three, kind of make the music For expand. Sure. Yeah. I think you can see that there are set pieces in every episode. It's a, it's it focuses on an aspect, but that's where why he he's who he is. Right. Like he was able to do that and, and attack that, but it does have an arc of film, like the beginning, episode one, episode seven. It's all of it comes home, man. It's yeah. a real big, and it's longer than I think the other ones, but it's man, it's it's solid, you know. Um, it, it, you know, he really told it well there. He he, he wrapped things up fantastically there, and. Um, this is about, I think, I think three hours of score or so. Wow, that's a lot of music. <laughs> yes, and, and it, over the course of a year and a half. It, it feels like not that much that in that way, but I actually wrote about four and a half hours of music because the original cut was about nine and a half hours. Yeah, long. wow. And um, it was another education in, in time management uh, because I teach at the Frost School, and um, I'm program director for this thing called the Musicianship, Artistry, Development, and Entrepreneurship Program, which is our popular music, contemporary music program. And we've been developing it, and it's a burgeoning program at the school. So there's a lot of things that we want to look over. But somehow, I was able to miraculously manage, you know, that and stay focused on the students' needs, and which is the main thing, and, and being able to get across the score, you know, write the score. And things got really hairy. I think as far as the incredible pressure of how are we going to do this, somewhere in um, March. March is when we had that first preview. And so February, I think, is when it started. We finished this score, uh, this movie, uh, dubbing and all of it, by the end of July. At the end of July. So from February to July, it was really incredible pace. It, like, it was an incredible pace. And... This being my second film, the first movie was really me with uh, Tom Kramer, you know, changing my diapers, if you will, you know, <laughs> on, on certain cues, like, how do you do it? And and this one, you know, I'd always heard that com all, most composers have teams and they have ways of, you know, that they hire people out, whatever. And I was like, well, coming from the classical stuff, it's not something you do. Yeah, you know, yeah. you just it's on you. And I had that real big stigma, but I talked to a lot of people that you know, in the industry and it's something you do. So I ended up getting recommended, uh, David Stahl, who I don't know if you know him, but you can look him up. He's an additional composer. And I, I started very, you know, reluctantly in March when things got like insane, there was no way, you know, you can do it alone because of the demands of the score and all the amount of production you have to hand in. So by that time, however, all of our themes were set. So we knew who the road good was. We knew who Frank Griffin's theme was. We knew the gang had its own theme. Whitey Wynn, uh, Alice Fletcher, all of the characters were set. Even the town has a theme in a way. Wow. And I'd love to talk to you more about that, like outside of the interview, yeah, I guess, yeah. because because <laughs> it's like nerd dumb and, and especially because of that picture on Skype, I, I think you'd, you wouldn't like start checking your phone. We'd probably get into the conversation. I'm sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, but I really, I'd really, it really, you know, had a mo all of it defined. Um, we worked on on the idea. I had worked on the idea of having music for place because it's such a long story that if you're in a location, it the music will help you identify it yeah, just by hearing it. I mean, yeah, the, the setting becomes yep. a character. Yep, and there are many locations. So, so I had to write music for LaBelle, music for a place called Blackton, where the Buffalo Soldiers had retired to to start make a new life, um, and then um, and and just overall, you know, like everything was defined. So then. Now we came to like a lot of a lot of output, like five minutes a day, five and a half minutes a day. We're having to be pushed out. And David came in and I played him the stuff. You know, I had this cue called Doubtful Canyon, which is the set piece of the opening of episode three. And I go, do you think you could do this, like take on some of the melodies and set them, you know, basically synthestrate them? Because the way it was is he said yes. You know, and I'm like, I'm sure he said yes, but can he do it? Mm -hmm. So I sent him this cue that I had sketched out on piano, knew the instrumentation, and I sent it to him, not not really sure how it was going to be. And I said, there's going to be clarinet or bass clarinet, and I need this to be strings and blah, blah, blah. I sent it to him. I keep going on another cue because now it's like two or three cues at the same time, just to kind of whatever. Where You're procrastinating on one cue by doing another cue. And, and like an hour later, he sends it back to me. I was like... Jeez, this sounds really good. You know, <laughs> like, I was like fanning out on David, you know, and 
Because I, I'm always, I mean, I really do, I really do see how like everybody had, brings a skill set and a, and a really amazing craft to this. And, and this is how we built a team, you know, for tombstones, I'd worked with, uh, um, Tim Davies, who's like a really great, he did, he's doing, uh, troll hunters now, yeah. but he's really known as a, as a conductor and an orchestrator and he's worked on frozen conducted. I mean, he's like the guy, yeah, right? Yeah. He's a friend of mine from USC. So when, when tombstones came, tombstones came up, I was like, I need someone to help me get the cues that are approved into onto paper and in front of the orchestra to, to play and record. And he's like, sure, mate, no problem, because he's from Australia, but I can't do the accent, so <laughs> I'm just saying mate. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I sent it to him, and that was that. So he had worked, and alongside him was Jeremy Levy, uh, who now you know took on this job because Tim was just too busy. And he's like, you want to try Jeremy? It's going to be great. And you worked with him in the past, and I did. And but that's the team. He has a bunch of people that they work with, you know, Bobby Brader, uh, Sarah Lutz, you know, and it was uh, just so awesome to realize that this is how it's done professionally. Yeah. You know, cause I, I'd like to pretend like and get a British accent with you. And yes, of course. And then I wrote the theme, but I do it. It's almost like you're, yeah. you're learning as you go. And, and as a fan of storytelling of this level, you know, to be able to work with, with the people I got to work with outside of the production, just in the music side, you know, again, Tom Kramer was a music editor, you know, and uh, by the way, Lawrence Manchester mixed it. And he's like, his daytime job is the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, what? And then he he also he also did work on The Departed, you know, right. and so he's like one of these ridiculously cool and nice people, like all all the folks I work. Well, you were under severe pressure and it never got like dramatic. We just worked. Yeah, Put our head I mean, down. It's, yeah, it's a it's a team effort, it's, and I think storytelling yeah. every every aspect of filmmaking, directing, and I mean, they have one name, but it's it's such a team effort, such a collaborative art form. It's I think why I love it so much. Me too, man. I mean, I really, and and just to, to have the trust of Scott, you know, as we were getting close to you know to to help in the storytelling, it's kind of ridiculous, man. It, it does feel a little bit ridiculous, you know, but it's fun because you get into. You're, you're digging deeper than just our, it's not even about the notes. It's about how, how does this feel? You yeah, know, how does the whole yeah. thing feel? And, and a lot of, a lot of moments came really uh, together really well in this. And that I'm proud of, of definitely proud of some scenes that I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, like it works, you know, and you're like, oh my God. And it sounds great. We got to record, uh, with the Budapest Art Orchestra, you know, and, uh, and the fact that Netflix was so helpful in that, they gave us an orchestral budget to work with, which afforded us to have people like Jeremy Levy and his team. And um, it was great. It was just a real privilege. Uh, you know, the other thing was a lot of the, the both scores, Tombstones and this one's are feel very handmade because um, uh, building the cues, it's like there's guitar and there's piano and I play the piano and I play the guitar and the bass actually for the main theme, you know, I'm playing the bass on that. So you're you're kind of building everything you know with part by part and piece by piece yourself and then i was able to get joy adams who's a, a colleague but now i think she lives in, in boulder colorado and she works remotely now and so you would send her something with the notes and she'd record it and send it back and put it in it's great and she's uh probably one of the greatest gifts i uh, i was able to have because you'll hear her. i don't even have to say much uh just the main theme it's her playing cello uh, she has a really good sense of Anglo-American music, you know, the stuff like Mark O'Connor, uh, Nickel Creek, you know, that sort of music where it's uh, basically it's called new grass, I guess, in a way, bluegrass and all of that tradition. You'll hear it. I mean, she's just so good. And <laughs> awesome. so so I got she was like uh, she was like the cellist for me and we worked really well together. And again, she is really all over the score. And so it gave it gave the characters soul. It gave the score a soul. You know, it was set around the cello and the and the classical guitar, I think. And all right, I'm talking way too much. I'll stop. <laughs> no, it's, um, I was I was congratulate you on such an amazing uh, accomplishment. I mean, got, a walk among uh, the tombstones was such a fantastic uh, film and, and score. And uh, congratulations on Godless. Uh, and uh, it comes out on Netflix, I think, November twenty second. And um, It'll be streaming, and I can't wait to 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 go through it. And Carlos, thank you so much for uh for chatting today. It's been such a an honor to just pick your brain for a little bit. 
Oh man, please just call me after we're done. I'd love to talk to you forever. This is like so cool to do. And <laughs> uh, but I really hope you enjoy the show. I really, really do ho hope you enjoy the music, man. Um, it was a labor of love on many, many levels, and we got to tell this story. It's a yeah. western, dude. What? I know my favorite genre. <laughs> yeah, dude. And 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 you know, it's. I, I'd love to hear what you think. Like brutal, just you know. Later, just yeah, you know, yeah. hit me up later, and you're like, okay. it sucks, or it's great, or whatever, you know. But <laughs> I'm excited, man. Thank you so much. Okay.